Half of Britain's destroyer fleet has finally shed one of its most embarrassing technical liabilities. After more than a decade of debate, engineering trials, delays, and political scrutiny, the Royal Navy now confirms that three of its six Type 45 destroyers have completed the long-running power improvement project. On paper, it sounds like routine maintenance. In reality, it marks the halfway point in one of the most complex and strategically significant naval refits undertaken by the United Kingdom in a generation. But what does this milestone actually mean for British naval power, for NATO task groups, and for the destroyers that were once criticized as the fleet's fair-weather warships? To understand the significance, you have to rewind to the original flaw that triggered this entire program. The Type 45S were conceived as cutting-edge air defense destroyers built around the powerful Samson radar and the Sea Viper missile system. But the ships entered service with a propulsion architecture that struggled in warm environments and under high electrical load precisely the conditions in which modern destroyers spend most of their operational lives. Deploy a Type 45 to the Gulf or Indo-Pacific, activate its advanced sensors, and the ship could suffer abrupt power failures, leaving a frontline asset dead in the water. For a Navy that prides itself on blue water expeditionary capability, this was more than a technical embarrassment, it was a strategic liability. The government's answer was the Power Improvement Project, an invasive engineering overhaul delivered under the wider umbrella of Project Napier. The objective was simple, rip out the fragile legacy diesel generators and replace them with a modern, more resilient power architecture. The execution, however, was anything but simple. Each destroyer required major hull cuts, removal of legacy machinery deep within the ship's internal compartments, and complete reconfiguration of electrical distribution systems. This was open-heart surgery on the Royal Navy's premier air defense combatant, performed while the rest of the fleet continued its global tasking. Now, according to Defense Minister Luke Pollard, three ships have crossed the finish line, HMS Dauntless, HMS Daring, and HMS Dragon. HMS Defender and HMS Diamond remain in refit, and HMS Duncan will enter the process during her next docking period. The minister avoided providing further details, a deliberate choice, he argued, because revealing schedules could expose availability patterns to potential adversaries. But his message was clear, the project is on track, and all six ships will receive the upgrade by 2028. For observers of British maritime capability, this matters. The Type 45S are the UK's only destroyers, each one a high-value strategic asset. They provide area air defense for carrier strike groups, shield amphibious forces, and contribute to NATO's integrated air and missile defense network. Losing even one ship to unexpected technical failures during an operation would be unacceptable. The fact that these failures were linked to predictable and unavoidable deployment conditions made the issue even more urgent. How do you project power globally if your flagship destroyers must avoid warm waters? The new generator arrangement, replacing the original pair with three larger units, promises not only greater reliability but also improved redundancy. A more robust high-voltage distribution system supports the radar suite and weapons package without the risk of tripping the entire ship offline. And in an era when all combatants are becoming electric warships, with sensors, weapons, and propulsion increasingly dependent on stable electrical supply, this resilience becomes a core component of combat effectiveness. In other words, the PIP upgrade does more than fix an old problem. It future-proofs the Type 45S for the escalating power demands of next-generation naval warfare. But this raises a strategic question. If the engineering solution is so essential, why has progress been so slow? Here the answer is less technical and more political. Dock capacity is finite. Operational commitments are constant, and the Royal Navy is managing a fleet stretched across the North Atlantic, Mediterranean, Middle East, and increasingly the Indo-Pacific. With only six destroyers available, pulling even one out of service for months-long refit cycles creates capability gaps that must be carefully balanced. It is a logistical puzzle with no easy solution. How do you rotate ships through the most intrusive engineering program in decades without undermining standing commitments? The Ministry of Defense argues that it has managed this challenge effectively, maintaining steady progress while keeping enough ships operational to support carrier strike operations, NATO assurance missions, and maritime security patrols. That balance has not always been perfect. Availability issues have periodically constrained deployments, but reaching the halfway mark suggests that the most disruptive phase of the program may now be behind the Royal Navy. Yet the real strategic question is whether the upgrade restores confidence in Britain's surface combatant force. Capability gaps attract scrutiny. Critics of the Type 45 program have long argued that the destroyers were over-engineered, underpowered, and fielded before their key systems were mature. Supporters counter that once upgraded, the ships will remain among the most capable air defense platforms afloat. 
Both arguments contain truth. The propulsion issue was a significant design oversight, but the fundamental architecture of the Type 45, its radar suite, missile system, and combat integration is world class. The PIP upgrade removes the most damaging weakness while preserving the ship's core strengths. This also plays into broader debates about the future of the Royal Navy. As the UK invests in the Type 26 frigates, expands its submarine programs, and pursues new unmanned capabilities, the question of fleet balance becomes increasingly important. Destroyers are scarce, expensive, and irreplaceable in the near term, ensuring that all six Type 45s can operate reliably globally and without power-related interruptions is not simply maintenance, it is a prerequisite for the Navy's wider strategic posture. So what comes next? HMS Defender and HMS Diamond will complete their conversions, Duncan will follow, and by the end of the decade, the entire class should be operating with modernized power systems. But the broader implication is that the Royal Navy will need to continually reassess how it manages major engineering upgrades while sustaining global operations. The PIP program may be a template for future overhauls on other classes, especially as ships become more electrified and maintenance cycles more demanding. Ultimately, the halfway point of the power improvement project is more than a technical update. It marks the beginning of the end of a vulnerability that once constrained British maritime strategy. With each newly upgraded destroyer returning to the fleet, the Royal Navy strengthens its ability to field credible, persistent, high-end air defense capability worldwide. And as geopolitical tensions rise and naval competition intensifies, the reliability of these ships becomes not just an engineering achievement, but a strategic necessity. If the remaining upgrades proceed as planned, the Royal Navy may finally put the Type 45's past failures behind it and shift the narrative from one of technical shortcomings to one of restored confidence and renewed operational reach.